First, maybe I should say good uh, afternoon to everybody, but I'm very honored to hear so much uh, from the Dean about my CV. You see, I'm like you, uh, let's say, a bit older student, but as it seems from my CV, I like uh, to discover, study, and I think it's a privilege if we can do that. I know that uh, as I have spent 15 years of studying, it should look strange, but I have to say I was in the same time after my first degree a high school teacher, you know, I, I, to, to pay for all my studies. So afterwards, you know, I had this privilege to study and to teach with young people. So it's a reason why uh, for 15 years I went through different disciplines and of course I continue all, all my life. So I'm happy to be here with all of you because we share the same uh, enthusiasm to discovery. And I have selected one topic which is simulating the complexity of human bodies. So before the Dean is leaving us, I would like to thank you and also Professor Jeanne uh, for letting me come in here and also Emma, I don't see her, but anyway, many people have organized this and I know it's always a lot of work. Okay, so my topic is about human bodies, you know, uh, and of course I speak of virtual humans or virtual human bodies. So I, I just continue with my small, uh, if I can go back, with my small films you have started to see before. Yeah. It's like just to show, uh, trying to, as it was said, we have worked on clothing and all kinds of topics, but clothing was a major thing, was and is. So, Okay, for the one in animation, you see we try to do in my lab, it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, I speak of my lab in Geneva. We, since uh, when I came to create this lab in '89, since then we have uh, designers or animators or what is the name. So it's completely a mix of different people. Uh, I, I started my career in Canada, and uh, from the beginning, you know, uh, the dean spoke about these old films uh, we were producing in the '80s, and it was always already with people coming from. Uh, I would say art or design and uh, engineering schools. So it's I never worked uh, otherwise, and you know we work in teams. So it's a reason why we can achieve a lot of things because we work together with a lot of know-how and we share the know-how together. Okay, so you see it's an image of the building in Geneva. Maybe it's not as green as here. I notice it's so green here. So and the snow flowers here. The climate, as we say, is milder. So you see, we are working on many different aspects on virtual humans and virtual worlds. Uh, we are very much interested uh, to work on robots, social robots. We have a handsome social robot at Michala, which has, uh, you know, a deformable skin. This is a, a lady a robot, and she looks really like a person. A bit, uh, you know, it's striking sometimes when we look at her. But anyway, we work on personality, emotion, relationship model. The idea is really to go for autonomous virtual humans that can recognize ha us, have a true relationship, remember. So I have PhD students working a lot on that. Closing, we are working since I will uh, speak uh, of, of it today. Uh, we are working since many years. Now we are making virtual try-on, I will show you. So you have a database of different clothes and you can see according to your dimensions how we look like. So it's very, you know, fashion oriented and trying collection before they exist. And of course we have worked on mixed and augmented realities. We have an EU project which was very successful, which was a, a simulation of life in Pompeii. So we could go with 3D glasses and we, we could see the Romans in cafes and so on, and eventually interact with them. So a lot, as you know, I have more than four uh, T7 projects, EU projects, so I have participated to all kinds of research. 
And if you see, uh, otherwise, uh, I had another EU project which is on PDAs and phones, you know, to be able to uh, more a multimedia project. Uh, uh, and what uh, are, is also a big topic today is a medical simulation. So today, out of this, what I like to speak is the creation of body, and you know, it's a human, virtual humans, how it is today in most films and application like game, and how it will be more and more uh, based upon medical knowledge, which I believe is one of the research of the 21st century. I believe very much in it. So it's what uh, I will talk to you today. Okay, so let's uh, go next. So the topic of human uh, bodies. So you see we are not all the same. And what I will say next is even in the interior of our bodies, we are not the same. I mean, our, the size of our or inter, interior organs are not the same. So that's quite interesting. You see, uh, we are all the same, but different size. And we have tried since many years, I have several PhD students working on the topic of uh, modeling humans. Of course, in many films, you have some designers making a lot of efforts to <laughs> make special effects, looking the human perfect. But in fact, uh, what we try to do, all the computer scientists know it, we try to make things automatic and not having so hard manual work. Uh, work. So this is a bit where the research is going on. Sometimes, if you see the first films we have done, for example, with Marilyn Monroe and Humphrey Bogart, Marilyn, many people told me she looks great and eventually not as good as what we can do automatically today. But at that time, we took one year to do it in 87, you know, and today we can produce uh, high numbers uh, interactively or automatically. So this is a big difference. The appearance is something else. Now in films, you know, a lot of people are working to make it. So if you look here a bit of the history, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't take the time to show you these old films. I should. But anyway, if you are interested, you find them on my website, Mihalab. You know, the first film, really a pioneer film that is now in the uh, research center, uh, history research center in Ottawa, in Canada, because I used to be in Canada until 89, is the film Dream Flight. And this film was the first virtual human, but in fact, it was a skeleton. And then that's a complete story about uh, the dream of this uh, virtual human coming to Earth and then went to New York and all kinds of things. So this was at that time. And then if you look at uh, the next one, a uh, major, this one, uh, the first one was uh, we did programming uh, for this film. That means it was like about 15 programming line of code of a language we have extended. It was a let's say like graphics language uh, extended to, from Pascal language at that time. And so making a film was, uh, the, the meaning was to make, to write 15,000 lines of code, just to say, and when the film is finished, you can throw away, okay? The big difference with the next one, so it's a couple of years later, we, we move from 82 to 87, then it's like an ancestor of Maya and all this kind of thing. Uh, or software, uh, commercial software, and this we have some, let's say, commands to define virtual humans, motions, and so on. So there was no more programming. We have high-level language, so it was also something largely shown and published. And this was also shown at the Modern Museum of Art in New York because it was like select has a award in terms of artistic award. You know the fancy things after my my quantum physics. PhD is that when we got dream flight, we thought, okay, we will get awards in terms of algorithms. No, we didn't get so many awards, but the awards came upon uh, art, you know. So, and then it went on with the with the story of Marilyn and Humphrey meeting in a cafe in Montreal, and this was, let's say, done mostly in terms of um, additional knowledge in terms of how we produce films. You know, at that time, uh, my students, at that time I left for Switzerland and my student created soft image. I was soft image. I don't know if you have heard from that, but it was a very important software. It was created from this film. And the first pamphlet from for, uh, 
uh, soft image were some images from this film because our students created a company with the help of the government of Quebec. So it has a huge impact, this film, in terms of companies, in terms of awards, in terms of, well, papers and so on. Okay, so you see, we are in 87, the first uh, famous legendary stars were simulated, and then afterwards community come in. At the beginning, we were just a few, Norm Badler, my husband and myself, at the beginning of the 80s, and then suddenly, the, you know, the film from Spielberg, I think a bit later on, came out, you know, about the dinosaurs. And people started to understand what is 3D. And it helps a lot the community to, to start this kind of research. And I think it went on in the 90s. Before we were fully alone, nobody was saying that crazy people, they work on that for what? And it was even difficult to get any money, you know? So you have to work day and night yourself because, well, no money. Students were afraid making a PhD on that. Well, uh, they were afraid that maybe it's not so well seen. You see, because at that time it was more about techniques of rendering, <coughs> modeling, object, but human for what? You see, and then it came massively in the 90s. So now we're no more alone from isolation. We are in a big, uh, uh, huge crowd of people around the planet, fortunately, <coughs> that embark and I think we'll go better for the research. Okay, if you see the next uh, uh, one is mainly Norm Badler, you know, one of the pioneers also in the field, and he has started to make several humans. So, you know, until Norm, I think it's a major paper because in 88, he was the one who started to make several. Before was, we speak of one, and then even, as I said, is a bit special. And also this one is quite interesting from the same team. He tries to make anthropometric based virtual human when it's a bit simple, you know. And the idea I will show you from my PhD, uh, Mustafa Kazap, who defended a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. So it's a bit the same idea, but you just, I mean, I won't say improvement because I know that in the scientific community, when you say improvement, your paper doesn't go through. So I should say innovation or some really original work, you know, otherwise it looks like you copy what the others have done and nothing special, okay. So here you know maybe this work for the ones who work on that, uh, there was a major work about scan data. So then we understand that from scanner, you know, human scanner, we can have scan data. And then of course it starts to be very precise, the body you see. And here, it's more like uh, we can work about shape, completion, and animation, not only static bodies, but we start to think, okay, let's go for animation. So you see, it's already later on. I mean, the, it takes time to progress, yeah? And here, this is one of my PhDs uh, who has worked on, you know, uh, you have template models, and you deform templates <coughs> according to other scan data. So it's always to go faster, more automatic, more natural, and so on. So this is why we have done this work that was pretty much uh, successful. Now, uh, the last one which I find interesting is because the last one, uh, no, the previous one here, is from a drawing. So the idea you have a sketch or a drawing and you can, from that on, make a, a 3D model. I think this is quite interesting all the time because it's going from your talent, then going to, of course, it's never precise enough and then we have uh, this kind of thing based on statistics. So you give numbers and then the computer will generate bodies. You see, I tell you, I have, um, I think, four or five PhD students successful who have worked on uh, uh, making bodies. Because as I said, Marilyn in 87 was one year of work. And in fact, if you would see the film, we put her like sitting like that. So you see her in a cafe. In fact, we just make the trunk, she had no legs, because it was too much work at that time. Already was enough to do that. So uh, you see that uh, making realistic bodies is quite a lot of work. So this is the work of my PhD student, as I said, Mustafa Kazap. And you can see that uh, now the question we ask when we like to generate automatic bodies, you know, also it, can be used for crowds, for all kinds of simulation. So what region are to be deformed? Uh, what is the range of values? And how efficient is it? Of course, we like to have real time and uh, instant results. So this is a bit 
So then you look what is existing. So there are some standards, anthropometry standards, and for example, we, we know two of them. And one is for the body, they give typical size, because how is the body defined? So you try to find the community which has things about it, thought about it, and then this is the first one. The second one is more for closing because we never go, uh, let's say, publicly nude around. So we are always closed. So when we speak of body, clothes are immediately part of. So because of that, it takes into account what is the standard for closing. What, what, how do we take into account the different shape? So we have worked uh, with several e European projects on that. And they are surveys, you know, because people are interested to see over time, culturally, over countries, how people are and are changing according to time. And one of the big, maybe you know it, is the Caesar analysis. I mean, they have uh, measured a lot of people uh, standing, sitting, and uh, they, they have uh, a database we can buy. I think it costs like, uh, I don't know, in pounds, maybe there's $30,000 at least. So you have to pay for it. And, but they are static bodies, but you have at least a database. And then you have other ones which has been done. Some of them are free of charge. So it's good to know that we have that. In our case, we were fully uh, linked with clothing industry. Not industry, but let's say as we work on clothes, we were not, we, the first criteria was to find out what is important when you have a clothes to have as measurements for your body. This was number one criteria. The other criteria we didn't take into account. So you see, in fact, from the closing industry and, and association, because we had several European projects with several companies, we have heard that, in fact, what is important, if you go into detail, of course, uh, then we need to have 13 girth measurements and eight length measurements. So this is what we have in our model. So we can modify all this, and that's enough to define a body. And so, of course, we have worked a human scanner uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, with this, we can, you see Mustafa in the scanner, we can scan anybody in a fraction of sec, I mean, a few seconds. And the problem is, what are the defaults of that? First is still the cost. I mean, a couple of years ago, we had to pay more than uh, 150,000 pounds. Actually, it's maybe cheaper, but still, if you have a full human body scanner, it's not so cheap. And this is not uh, uh, enough, because what you see is, in fact, we get millions of points, but a lot of data which are uh, not so good. We will see here, uh, first of all, what we get is this. So. It's no meaning you have to structure that. I'm sure among you, some of you are working on meshing uh, from point clouds. So this is research done everywhere. And what is uh, good to know for the ones who don't work on that, and it's what we see, in, we don't see it, but it's empty. Everybody, virtual body you see from films or whatever who looks so great. In fact, if you make slice, uh, Slices is nothing inside, it's just the surface, a colored surface, a very, uh, let's say, rendered surface. So, And this surface is just a form even. Now, how is the question? All is fake. Because even in the animation today, uh, you know, it's normally in uh, nature, you have a muscle contraction that moves the bones. But in, in <coughs> animation, you have the bone that move and eventually if you have muscle they will modify uh, uh, but you know it's exactly the contrary so everything is fake it's just effects but if we like to go for medical field where we will model, model each of our body uh, then we need to have more precise data and it's a bit what i would like to show you today i mean there are special effects where all the bodies are empty and you get this, and afterwards, all the motion is motion track. We will see how we motion track. Surely, you have motion capture here, but just to say, of our experience, but this is always to make, to look great. This is always the thing, to look great, to be eventually real time, but to test, to have a vision of our real body, individual body, well, it's useless. But, okay, it's 
you know, uh, I am born with this, uh, or born, uh, academically speaking, with uh, making the first virtual humans, and we were so happy if the virtual human looks like the real one, you know. That was like a dream for years and years and years. It's only in the 90s you started to think elsewhere, uh, otherwise. Uh, it's, it, it was this. Okay, so you see, for example, here we see a close-up shot, five scan slides from torso. You see you have this, and, and then afterwards the, we need to, to, to do a, like a meshing, is what I say. First you get this with a lot of noise, and then afterwards you have to take the noise and to, to use geometric method to do it. So my, my PhD student, his work was more to you go to the human scanner and then afterwards you, you, without anything, it's automatically you are animated as a virtual one. So you see a lot of work has to be done automatically. So here you see there is a triangulation. As everybody knows in computer graphics, we need mostly to go for triangles, which is easy afterwards to render and so on. So we go for and deform. So this is a bit what has to be done. Of course, if we speak of real time, and this is also the work of my PhD student now, is we cannot have so many triangles. So if you make real time, you have to decrease to 5,000 polygons maximum. When I say so, it could be less than that. But it should always look great. So you have always this equation of looking great, but few polygons. So this is what we do. And here you see uh, one of a uh, lady, a static mesh, and then we, you know, having static bodies, we are never static, even if we, if we sit, or you look at me now, hopefully, then you do something. So we are always in animation. So we need to have, at least for the body a skeleton, or for the face, facial animation. So here you see that for each of us, uh, we need to add the, the appropriate skeleton, which is different for everybody, as we don't have the same size, but it should be also done more or less automatically. So if you look here, in fact, um, we, what I said, we take the, this uh, standard for the body, and then we can use it for, for clothes, and we use the bounding box uh, to deform, because now when we have a skeleton, then the body can move. Of course, you are done with the deformations. And deformation is a big topic. Many people around the planet, researchers are working. If I move automatically, my surface is deformed, but it's not deformed the same way everywhere. So it starts to be that I don't think we have any method today which deforms in a higher level and according to the different body part or articulations we don't have. Many people work on this body part or this other body part because in fact it cannot be exactly the same method. Anyway, we, we have worked a lot on that. So you see the automatic pipeline we are doing and we have now, uh, it was a, a more or less at the beginning this one, is that you have uh, the point cloud we get from the scan data and afterwards, we have to, to clear it, you know, taking the noise. Then we have to make the triangulation. Then we have to add the, the skeleton and adapt the skeleton. One thing I forgot to say is if you are smaller or let's say smaller, then if the first one has made motion capture with his size or her size, then if you are smaller, it doesn't fit because you will cross the floor. So you have to take into account that uh, the, the motion we're targeting, if one motion has been recorded for one size, it doesn't fit for the other one. So automatically it should be uh, motion we target. So this is also a PhD student in our lab because as I said, we work, there is no PhD working alone. And so we always make PhD which, uh, you know, a topic, high level topic is defined and several join and we have groups trying to solve a problematic. Okay, so you see it's uh, like to put in, in a condition, you know, you scan somebody and then after you put this person in, in condition, okay, this I skip. Now you have, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, research. I can show you how we, we use also the system. Our system is from scan data, but there is also an interactive system where we can give our dimension and they are automatically uh, generated in real time and, OK, 
Okay, so you see a bit uh, application with the closing immediately, which is not obvious, as you know, I don't like to speak in details about it, but those who have worked on close is something quite complex because first close are physically based and second they are linked with the body. So whatever we do with our deformation, the clothes have to follow. And there is huge discussion in any, uh, let's say, company that produce clothes is because every year they throw away thousands of clothes because it doesn't fit, so people don't like and so on. So the idea is, okay, we produce virtually, people can try on and eventually they buy and we do it only upon request. I don't say it will come only that way, but it will decrease uh, the number of uh, wasted in clothes we have because it's terrible. And the other thing is also that it will better fit because as you have seen, the bodies are all very different and with the standard sizes, it's very difficult for many people to find the normal fit for the body. And this is also something that will come, you know, more and more people will have to define their furniture and then send this to production. Or you have a 3D printer that will produce your own things. And we can imagine it's the same for clothes. We can, you know, give some guidelines to some people and everybody is creative enough. In fact, if we are educated like that, we can also be creative. And then we can produce some kind of style and afterwards having the computer calculated the clothes, sending this to a print, uh, 3D print, I mean, taking the clothes into account, the quality of the clothes. At least we have been working years. It's, we have started this in 89, so you see it's a long way, and I know pretty much the problem now, the market uh, with all these ideas, what they would like to have is let's say to press just buttons and today is not possible because we to clone somebody it takes time to make a clothes by computer it takes at least half an hour and all that if we make a t-shirt in half an hour interactively then the company won't pay because you have to pay the person plus computer plus everything so it's still too expensive so that's the reason why uh, it's still to be more done but at least we are on the way so what I would like to show you next to that, where we you, you use all this body, uh, which is very important, is the virtual try-on. So the idea is uh, we have a phone or computer or whatever, a laptop, and you would like to try your clothes, so according to your dimension. So you see here we have an example of what we are finishing right now. We will put it soon on the website, so if you keep Miralab in mind, Maybe you can try yourself with your body dimensions and try some clothes we propose and then see how it fits. I mean, we have mostly ladies' clothes, of course, but maybe uh, next we will come for men clothes, you know, uh, because men is less fancy, I mean, less diversity, you know, the ladies is a bit more fancy for us. Yeah? It's also more difficult, more challenging, yeah? Okay, so I just show you a bit of... Uh, it's not the uh, next, uh, this week on the weekend, we are showing a demo in Singapore in IEEE, you know, a VR conference, so where people can try. So what I say is, will be demonstrated in Singapore next coming weekend. So people will uh, themselves give, interactively give their dimension, as you have seen, and then uh, they can choose the clothes and they will see themselves animated exactly like here, you know, so you have an example of this. This is a bit an older version. Now we are finishing this thing demo for VR, which is to be held next weekend or next week in Singapore. So you see, you customize, customize even your face, yeah, because you can take a photo and then you put your face. So when of PhD students have work on that, surely some of you work on that. You know, the problem is you can get this kind of demo if people work together. If one work only on the face and say, okay, it's my work, but then you have nothing. But in our lab, we always work. We dream of something and then we work together. And, you know, as I say, I always believe in joint work. Otherwise, one alone is difficult. So you see. So I hope to put this on the web soon, so available for everybody, you know. <laughs> this is a dream for five years. We should have finished 
long time ago, we had always problems, motion restart checking, uh, all kinds. The real time aspect of clothes was nightmare. This was a real time simulation because normally clothes takes more time. normal bodies because it's not just, uh, you know, mannequins because it's real, the bodies. So you can see, afterwards we will add decor, so you go to a party or whatever, you see how it would look in the decor. And you can ask to Facebook, whatever, uh, friends, how do you feel I look like if I have this, you know, it goes, I mean, there's a lot of possibility in this. And this is fancy to do, at least for me, okay, but I think the ones who work on that, they, they find it fancy. So I just give you a small overview. Of course, we do a lot of other things, but you know, I, I, I like to go to my favorite topic today. And I think because you are most uh, very young people, I think the next thing is really the medical. I'm very convinced of that because you know, I have been working so much on this Marilyn and all kind of nice uh, things, but at the end, you think, how can I do my work which is a bit more useful? Of course, you, you produce methods to make games, and people are happy when they do games, and at least most of them, okay? But in the medical, you have the impression that eventually you can help, you know, that people are more healthy, and it sounds a bit more uh, important. So that's the reason why I like to introduce this. Surely some of you, and Professor Jean, uh, has a lot of expertise also, and I think many researchers here. So I'd just like to show you a bit what we have done in our project, EU project, which was a Marie Curie project just finishing, and it was really anatomical human. So just to see that you have seen before, my all in the films, avatars, which look great. You have seen how it is. It's just a surface, okay? Now if you look, in fact, it's how we are. and. You know, for face, you have 20 years of research to be able to determine what is the features and what is the animation, and still going on. But imagine when we have to, the internal organs are as different as each face. I mean, we don't have the same stomach in terms of uh, position, exact position. And in medicine, you have to, to work very precisely, otherwise no medical doctor will be able to work with you. So we have a long experience since more than 10 years to work with medical doctors. So you see here, you see a bit of, uh, exa for example, uh, we can have uh, all this. Uh, and, and here, what is interesting just to remind is, in fact, we have 206 bones, but they are articulated. And uh, we have 650 muscles and tendons, and we have connected soft tissues. And what you know, if we wouldn't have them, we would have the bone uh, working together, and we, would, it, we, we, we couldn't survive, we would have so much pain. So, thanks to cartilage, ligaments, and these uh, connective soft tissues, we can move without having pains. So, it's very important. And we will see that, uh, in fact, um, if we look, uh, and it's what I, we have been working since 10 years with medical uh, professors in Geneva. Uh, we have here a simulation of articulation. And what you see here is an image we can get in the MRI tube. Because here we don't build people from dimensions, because dimension is good for uh, external surface. But now here we go from images that the medical doctors get when we are in an MRI tube. So, and then what is interesting, this is static, is what they see today, they have that. But what they would like to have is our 3D reconstructed organs and to be able to see how it, it, it moves in real time or eventually to forecast what could happen if. So this is what is being asked today. And in fact, it's very, very useful because you see that we have a lot of diseases because we have problems with our articulations. 
And we see that there are 100 million people in Europe who, which are affected. And it's not just, uh, it costs a lot to treat these people. So the idea of our field is if we can, and I will show you, we have done this with ballerinas of the Great Theatre in Geneva, if we can predict when they are young what will happen if they continue to do this extreme motion, then we can know better before it happens. And this is very important, not just have uh, the final status of somebody, but saying, okay, you are at this stage, it could happen to this stage with a lot of other data we know. So this is a bit what is what I explained to you, you know, when the cartilage which protects the bones over the age and even young people, because this lady, a beautiful lady, you will see the dancers, ballerinas, they have problems of cartilage because, well, the reason is not known, but uh, then they have very high pain. And if we know that the uh, the you know, dance uh, ballerinas, at the age of 40, uh, almost 80% uh, of the ladies has to go to hip surgery. You understand? So that's, it's predictable. Maybe we could do something before, you know? And when you go for hip surgery, very often it, it is only for 10 years you have to start again because it doesn't hold for the rest of the life. So you understand that this problem is very important. Okay. We have started here again as really pioneer because we started in 93. It was the first European project. The name was Charm. And I can show you a bit. It will look a bit old, but okay, you, you, you will see. So at that time, I don't know if you remember, at that time there was a, a, a visual uh, data set. There was this guy in America that was put to death, well, unfortunately, and he gave his body to science. And the first time in history, some people sliced it, and so we can go through and see, and we can afterwards segment. So we have at that time, we had this database, otherwise it would be impossible to have. At that time, we didn't have any images. The medical doctors were keeping their images for themselves. You couldn't get anything at that time. And that's the reason why uh, we, fortunately, we had this database at the moment we started the, the work on this project. So just to say, it was like, uh, these images, I will skip a bit, but what we did, and it's the same today, sometimes we do the same but better, uh, it's just that from this on, PhD students were defining segmentation method. That means that when you have this, the computer has to define which are the organs which compose the image. And over the stack, building from one image to the other, the 3D uh, component. So at that time was highly interactive. <coughs> what is nice to see, because it, it's 93, if I go a bit further down, I don't like to, you know, it's what we have reconstructed at the time. So at that time it was not patient specific. The idea was to have the shoulder done for one person, let's say generic. But what was nice, you see, it's a boss, it's a big boss at the University of Geneva, who is a surgeon with, with another one who is professor in radiology. So they, they were convinced, which you know for the time being was nice, and they noticed that the guy had a problem with the shoulder. You see, they noticed that the guy who has uh, died, he had a serious problem, so they could uh, detect this with this kind of image. So it was, let's say, a nice collaboration work. When you work on medical, you cannot do it by yourself, useless. You can only do it with medical doctors because first, we don't understand so well and second, it needs to be validated. We need absolutely to work with them. It's not always, here we have developed a topological modeler. That means the relationship between all muscles, organs, you know, like a bit topology, topology between all and then we could uh, work on it for the, for the articulation, so we can go a bit further down. So you see here, we have quite a complex model to articulate the shoulder, which is, in fact, the articulation is very, very complex. And uh, we were in Michalab responsible of the 3D modeling from segmentation, and other were uh, responsible of the kinematic aspect or the finite element model to uh, model the deformation of the muscles, so because you remember in the real life, the muscles, once they contract, they can uh, allow the bones to move, which now in the virtual humans is not like that because there is no muscle. So, okay, if we look at that, you, I, I think we have seen most of it. 
just uh, I don't like to go for these old things, but you yeah, just to know it's 93, and most of the uh, things has now in our project is pretty much a bit the same philosophy. The main thing which is different is patient specific, and it's extremely different because at this project we made a generic model. Now we are going to for everybody, and this is uh, what we did. So here. Uh, you know, when you start, and it's so much to do, I tell you, we will be busy, and you will see it more than myself, of course, uh, hopefully, that uh, we will take all the century, because it's so much work to do. I mean, we are totally at the beginning of that, to model organs, animate them, but it's just, just animation to look good. It should be millimeter-based upon prediction models that are believable, you see, so it needs a lot of work. So. We have worked on the hip this time in the last project. As you can see, it's quite interesting uh, because it's composed of soft and hard structures. And uh, in fact, the articulation is like a ball and socket joint. And we do a lot of uh, movements thanks to our hip. And what is also important is the hip supports two thirds of total body weight. So if you have a problem with the hip, you can imagine that it uh, prevents you uh, to, to do a lot of things. And, of course, a lot of forces are transferring to the hip. So this is quite an interesting articulation to analyze. And so what we, we were doing, you know, you have here these ballerinas. Uh, one medical doctor in Geneva, a surgeon, is the medical doctor of the Grand Théâtre of Geneva because this lady has oft, so often problems with the hip. And we have been working with 30 ballerinas of this uh, grand theater. And we have the support of this medical doctor who sees each one. And each one was scanned with MRI. And so we get for each one data and they went for motion capture. You will see how we have worked. But let's say, why these ballerinas? As I said, uh, they had problems of uh, osteoarthritis. But why, when they are 20, you know, these ladies were around 20, why do they have that? What is the cause? So nobody could say what, obviously we could say, okay, they make extreme motion is because of that, but that, it, it needs to be proven. So, uh, because it's a huge problem, uh, we speak of ballerinas, we can speak of football people, all kind of people who do a lot of sports, it's the same. As myself, I like art and, let's say, simulation, I prefer taking uh, ballerinas, but of course we could have taken uh, tennis people for the elbow or soccer people, it, it doesn't matter. So you see, there are some information to know, for example, is the hip overloaded or is it a repetitive movement? So that's all kind of things and to, to, to discuss here. So if you look here, that's uh, the problem of this lady, they have high pain, loss of mobility, and uh, it's, of course, economically, uh, as I said, it's very difficult. So that's a bit all the study which is done. So how do we study that when you start? Because when it is a generic, okay, you have seen, you can do once and you are happy. But when it goes for each of us, we should have our hip simulated, or let's say, to start with our 30 ballerinas, we need some uh, framework overview. So the framework is, First of all, you see in the tube we get for each one the MRI data from the hip. But we have to take more because if you like to make simulation, you have to go at least to the knee because in the simulation it's not enough to have only the hip. And then afterwards we, we need to have segmentation as we can see, segmentation. So segmentation, I have a PhD student also defended his PhD very recently. And he worked on more automatic method. That means that you give this stack and this computer is able to detect which is what and reconstruct. So very few interventions. Uh, the problem is it's very uh, articulation specific. Here too, there is nobody who has proposed a method that can be applied to the shoulder or to other articulation. It starts from scratch for each of them. It is very dedicated to the <coughs> it's, it's a lot of work to do. And you see here what we can do is we like to have simulation because you remember we don't have only the bones. We have cartilage, we have ligaments, and when we have problem, it's because the cartilage is destroyed. 
So how much is it destroyed when the person is moving? Can we estimate? And then we need to simulate this part. And what we need also is the external of the person. So what we have done, you know, the scan data, it works also for that. So we have the external data, and then afterwards, we register with the medical, or let's say the anatomical part that comes from MRI. So this is a bit, and here we, we have put this in a volumetric meshes in order we can make true simulation uh, of the cartilage and analysis of what happens. So just going through about this method, uh, about what we do, you know, I don't know if you are familiar with MRI, but let's say I just, because myself I have to start it from this, maybe you are more familiar, but let's say when I started I was wondering myself, what is it? So I understood that uh, you, mostly what is tested and produced for the image is the water, but you know, in fact, some uh, nu atom in nuclei has, uh, let's say, a magnetic moment, magnetic moment, and when you put them on the tube, they, they can uh, move and they have like a signal and this signal, when they relax back, then it's what is recorded. So in fact, uh, we have two kinds of data that allows to produce the image, is the relaxation time, when the nuclei relax, so uh, it can be either longitudinal or it can be transversal. And depending on which tissue, they react differently. So it's how they can get this kind of different uh, image. So, in fact, you see here, it took us one year just to say how long it takes. You know, it was huge effort with medical radiologists, professors, and also to get the, you know, the links because they don't like to be disturbed. These people have a lot of surgery to do, and if you come for long-term research, they say, good, but today I have patients, not so much time for you. So you need to, at least we started in the 90s, and now they are open, but it, it was not automatic, let's say. And so what you see here is some uh, protocol of how we can get good image because normally MRI data you see mostly soft tissues, you don't see the bones. For the bones you take CT data. So CT are invasive for ladies, it can be dangerous. For example, if we have the hip, it can uh, touch the ovaries or this kind of thing, so it's not good. So that's the reason why we take MRI and because of that, you see here that we have made one year different protocol until the image is so clear that for segmentation we can use it, otherwise the computer doesn't see the difference and cannot do it. You see, so that was something. Here we can see that from one trans uh, longitudinal uh, view, we can have different uh, resolution. So it's not obvious that we have to take only the same. So from one view, you can take different resolution and recompose and understand. So this is a research in itself. We have a lot of people working around the planet on that, maybe in Guernemus too. So here we have also work on dynamic MRI. When you are in the tube, now you can move a bit, not so much because you are in the tube, but you can move. And then in real time, we can record uh, the, the image. And you can see, and this is good for validation when we have reconstructed. Now what they do, more and more, they have open MRI. So it's like, uh, you know, you stand, you are in the open, so you can move a bit more. It's not like in a tube, as you will see. It's, it's something better. Okay, so then we have this image. We have made a protocol. But to start with, with our methods, we are based on, uh, let's say, uh, example models. So that means that, first of all, we have uh, these images. But by, by, by hand, we started to have perfect model, which we named generic model, to help afterwards the automatic construction. So the idea you have perfect generic model from someone and then with the new images it will change register uh, for from this one will change towards the new data of the, the specific person. So you see here is how we work. We have the lower uh, limb and here we have other other things. High resolution knee we have in detail the knee. So if we have problems for knees or, um, let's say, hip, we have at least the perfect 3D model. And then this 3D model will be changed according to individual data. So it's what I say. We go for individualization. So 
The other part was pretty hand done with the medical doctors together. And then afterwards, this generic will adapt to patient specific <coughs> data. So we have model to image res uh, registration. We have also the skin registration, we will see. And we have motion computation. So in fact, for those who are working on that, I don't like to go too much in details for those who don't know about it, but just to say that this is a complete intensive research. And in fact, the generic mesh, you remember what we have anyway, if, it's, if we reconstruct muscles, bones, and so on, it is also so lumped mass particles. And this, as it changes uh, according to time, is subjected to forces. So we have, in fact, to take into account two kinds of forces, the internal ones, which are based on mesh configuration, and the external one, which are based on external factors like image and collision. So you see it's uh, like particles that evolve uh, over time according to different forces. In fact, the deformation from the generic towards the real one is what is applied. So here you have some results. You see here you have the generic and the generic and you have the real image, for example, for bone. And you see that I don't know if you can see, it moves a bit, the segmentation is automatic, and it changes the generic according to the individual. It's the same for this one, you have the cartilage, the system tries to identify the different, and then it will change this one to the same here, you, you see, in fact. So, this has been done more or less automatic, uh, and, and this is a PhD student working hard for, for four years on that. And, okay, but I mean, you see, it's still, the, the, the field is still open if you go to, to, now, you know, we have used the Vicon because we need to have the motion of the person. So it's our Vicon room in Geneva, so you see the ballerina, and she makes some, uh, they have in dance typical uh, motion, for example, it's, and it's all in French, this one is grand plié, you know, you have a s nomenclature of different motion for dance. And she's doing that, lateral split. So they are very, you know, they can make these 100 times. You can ne never stop them, they like it. They are, they are like rubber, you know. That's incredible, they can stay well. One, two hours, always, you, you know. And all these are typically uh, dance motion they are doing. It's important to categorize in order we analyze more in which one there is problem more than another one. You see, it's what, uh, so we have recorded the motion, so we have uh, <coughs> the, the body from the scanner, the motion, we have from the MRI the reconstruction of the lower leg, and then afterwards we, we um, put this all together. Okay, so here you have again uh, the, the session you have seen before with uh, the scanner, you know, but you have seen she has uh, sensors uh, on the body, and these are also when she goes on the, on the MRI. So then it's correspondence between the MRI and uh, the body scanning. So this is what we have. Then if we look, uh, this, is, this is what we get from this, okay? And then we get this from MRI. And then the idea, you know, we construct from MRI, this is from MRI. And then afterwards we need to register because as we have only one anatomical part, we register this, what we get from MRI in, in this part. And the, of course the markers and all the information we have uh, helps to, to do it. Now you see, uh, now, now it's just a bit of information how we work. As, as she's moving, you know, the markers are moving too. And in fact it's a cluster of markers she has on the body you have seen. And uh, in fact, uh, we can say that uh, it's, uh, the mo movement of a cluster is, has two effects. is the sum of an internal cluster deformation. And also, the, because she moves, she has also the, the bone uh, def um, movement. So in fact, all this information will allow the muscle contraction in the simulation to, to operate. So in fact, you would just have a result of this. You have the lady. And you see the, the markers around, they are moving, and the information will 
which allowed here is only the bones shown, but we will see afterwards we have added cartilage, muscles, and so on. We have mostly worked on cartilage because cartilage is the, the part that if we don't have, it's terrible. The pain is terrible. The muscle is another story, you know. Anyway, there is nobody who has really done a virtual muscle because a virtual mus uh, muscle is done upon hundreds of fibrils, you know. I don't know how we say this in English, but let's say, you know, elastic fibers. And then if we have to take into account all the reality of these fibers, well, I mean, it's still a lot to do. What I show is just the, the top of the iceberg, you know. We have to go much more in detail. And if we would go more biology-based, molecule-based, and I tell you, I'm not sure that the 21st century is enough. But OK, why not? We are here to do something. And if we can, you know, do this kind of interesting thing, it's a privilege, so why not? I tell you, it's really nice. OK, so if we go next now to this, uh, I told you that the MRI, as the lady does some motion, we try to, to let her do some MRI, dynamic MRI, in order we can check that what we simulate is the same as what we can record. So this is a bit uh, what we have done here. Now, what is very important is with the soft tissues. As I said, the problems finally is, of course, the bones are moving, but the problem is the cartilage or tendons. And when they have pain, it's because of the cartilage. If the cartilage is uh, uh, hurt or destroyed, then the pain starts. So in fact, if we look at this model here completely, uh, we, we have um, this, we have a, a simulation model, and then we enter the anatomical model we have, the bones and cartilage. We enter mechanical <coughs> parameters, which are not easy to get. For example, we have worked the same way with clothes. That clothes, you can measure every, param every clothes you have machines, where you can measure the physical parameters. How do we get these physical parameters of cartilage for each individual? Not possible. We don't know today how to do it. So what we do is for food animals, some animals have similar, more or less, uh, physical parameters as we have. So we take these measurements from cartilage from coming from animals, from food animals. So in our case, is what we have used to get these values here. Otherwise, we wouldn't. But you see, it's still approximate. We cannot say it's individual. But maybe one day will be some new method, measurements. You don't know. With, I don't know if it's X-ray or whatever. I just say like that, that will allow to know the physical parameters of our uh, soft tissues. I hope at least it's open topic. And you see, because I said that when you simulate, you have to simulate in actions. We have to know, according to the weight of the person and different other weights, we have to put loads in order we can simulate the, the, the behavior of the hip. So this is a bit, finally, what we simulate, you know, we have the hip and we have this cartilage. And when you see color, that means that it, it, it has some damage. And how far is the damage is what we evaluate with the medical doctor. So if we, if we see this here, it's a bit in summary, how we work, you know, is a bit uh, still on the investigation phase. But what we do, we uh, have motion capture and MRI. Motion capture is a motion of the person. MRI is, you remember, the data we get from MRI tube. Then when we go patient specific, then we can analyze uh, for motion capture. Anatomical modeling is spatial specific. And the simulation is how we we can simulate the deformation of cartilage. So you see here, you, we have worked, we have developed, in fact, it is coming from our software from closing. It's quite interesting, but we have extended to volumetric approach, and we use the same extended software to apply for the deformation of cartilage. So you see, for example, one lady, we will see afterwards when she's doing some motion, uh, we can record what she has there are some predefined recordings, but then when she dances, we can know how, uh, for each of them, uh, how it is. And the medical doctors from the image, they make traditional measurements on the image, and they can compare if what we say is right according to their credentials. And 
in our case, most of the, it, it was absolutely uh, fitting to what they have uh, discuss, discussed. So here, what is being said is a bit what I have said, you know. Uh, um, here it's what the medical doctors do, you know what they do today. They have this kind of, let's say, sometimes image. This is a reconstructing, but they, they divide this into different parts and they take uh, like a millimeter rule, a ruler and then they calculate, uh, you know, how, how are the relationships. So this is how they do, they do by hands actually. So you see here the results of all the study just to, uh, if you didn't work on this kind of studies before, you can see a bit uh, how we have worked and what is the results. Here you see a lady, she's 18 years old. Uh, she has a body weight of 48 kilos and she made this kind of movement because uh, it was noticed that these are the most uh, problematic movement and so uh, the color represents the computer stress so we can see the simulation I hope it work no, I don't know why wow. okay uh, we will I try again otherwise I have another one in the end I don't know why it was working on my computer, but okay. So here, what we can analyze after this simulation, that a bit the stress, the evolution of the stress according to time. So we, we have here the angles and the, the time, and we see how it changed according to time, and the peak also. So we, what was noticed that the stress peak is located in the superior region. Unfortunately, I couldn't show the slide, the, but you will see other one, uh, final ones you can see. So my two final videos, I hope they will work here, because we can pity otherwise. <coughs> otherwise, I can take my computer back. Let's wait. <coughs> Oh. I was too impatient. <laughs> In fact, she's dancing. We, we have we have celebrated 100 years of no mayor or more of that. The University of Geneva has uh, 450 years, and we were asked to present this to a big audience. And then the lady was dancing on a big table. And when we could see, and it's what I like to show you, but okay, uh, it's in my other computer, but my other computer has no sound, so I moved to this one, which we cannot see the film. Well, it's maybe worse, but okay. Uh, but what we see is she's dancing, and we can see all the deformation when she's dancing. And of course, it's quite interesting, because more and more, it would be nice when they, we do actions, that we can see where is the problem, when we do action, so it's a bit what I like to show you. Maybe uh, will be possible later on. Or I can leave the films for those who are interested. So this is the end of my presentation. I thank you so much for uh, listening to me and coming to this presentation. Yeah, thank you.